that's his music, was a composer who certainly took inspiration from Wales. He could see Wales from his beloved Malvern Hills. And I don't think Elgar would have quarrelled with the claim we like to make for being a land of song. After all, we do produce musicians in plenty, great singers, instrumentalists, choirs, and occasionally a top-flight conductor. Owen Arwell Hughes, used to the great orchestras of the world, the world's great concert halls, but today back at the grassroots in the city where you were brought up in Cardiff. Yes, I was brought up here, but I was actually born in my aunt's house in Rhonda, and my father being in the BBC, we moved around a bit, and eventually on my first birthday, we settled back here in Cardiff. Not very far away. No, just up the road, and this is the very road that I walked down to go to school. Mind you, it was a lot different in those days. How was it different? Well, first of all, this was a brand new school. This school opened on the day that I arrived as a young first former. And uh, it was different simply because there were no facilities at the school. This road was not here. There were no houses at all here. And this road was then one single dirt track. Out in the country? Absolutely out in the country. And in the winter, particularly, this track became a river of thick, oozing red mud. Really? So we arrived yeah. filthy at the school. <laughs> and your headmaster wouldn't like his brand new school being no, messed up by no, your shoes. No, he didn't like it at all. And so we all had to change into daps. Black daps. Now then, David, do you know what daps are? Oh, and everybody brought up in Cardiff knows what daps are, plimsolls. Right. Well, here we are. And I wonder whether it strikes you as very different. In many ways, it doesn't. The actual building is exactly the same. But what is very apparent and different is that there are girls here. Oh. We never had girls. It was a, just a boys' school. And more importantly, see, it's Lady Margaret was the girls' school here. And this great divide, it's only 30 yards, but we could never cross that. But in a very strange way, by the time I was in the fifth and sixth, there was a sports master here called Walter Locke, a real, real character. He decided we must have a dance, fifth and sixth. And he said, boys, you've got to learn how to dance. And so he taught us how to dance. But uh, I was only able to go up and down. I couldn't turn the corners, so by the time... But, but we had a good time. You danced with the girls, was well, that the idea? they brought the girls over. It was quite an amazing thing that happened. That was good, very, very enjoyable. The other thing I remember as well, I see just a stump left of, of what was a flagpole. And our headmaster had a, the Welsh dragon up there, and that was his pride and joy. But we came in the morning after one of these dances, and I'm afraid it was a pair of pants and uh, bra flying up there. And uh, perhaps rightly so, he went absolutely bananas. <laughs> this was, I think, the celebrated Mr. Sinclair, who was a North Countryman. Yes, Archibald Sinclair, a tremendous character. People perhaps thought he was a bit strict, but he was strict on us for a reason, because he cared about us um, very, very deeply, actually. And um, I remember very often we used to have speeches, assembly every morning, and every now and then the speeches would come, usually about the way we behaved with the girls or something. And one in particular, Boys, we must extirpate this moral gangrene, this cancer of the soul. We're all sitting there thinking, oh, we keep going because we're missing first lesson. Yes. You know, we loved it, yeah. Thanks, sir. Same old doors, possibly, or Yes, they are. Same entrance hall. Mind you, we'll come in the posh way. Because when I came to school, we weren't allowed to come this way. It was on the back. Until you were in the sixth form, then you came in here with the staff. And I felt very, very proud. Well, this is quite a posh foyer, I must say. There's plenty to look at. Yes, it's amazing. Um, the shields we see around, the headmaster, uh, Sinclair, started uh, this idea of having the shields from all the different colleges in the country, as well as the colleges of Oxford and Cambridge. And they're around the hall as well. Also, the, the, the cabinet, um, the trophies. And they seem to be succeeding, uh, David, because it's quite full at the moment. That's it's good. Plenty of cups in there. Yes, yes. I'll let you into a secret. Somebody told me that I would be able to spot your name up there somewhere, and I think I can see it with London next to it. That's right, yes. I didn't know it was there, actually. Yes, I went to the Royal College of Music. Well, well, well. Scholarship? Yes, it looks like it. Today's headmaster is Hilton Hughes. Welcome to the school. Welcome back to Howard. It's always good to welcome back an old boy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, I've noticed that uh, things haven't changed very much here in the foyer, and tradition seems to be playing a very important part still in the school. 
Well, certainly it looks like it, doesn't it? From the Honours Board and so on, it would seem that we are still committed to tradition very strongly. But it's important, in my view, to realise that these things are only the outward symbols of tradition. And if, it's in, if tradition is to matter uh, at all, it's got to mean something more, such as a commitment to certain uh, attitudes and uh, moral values, the kinds of things which I believe were also regarded as important in your day, and the school is certainly still committed to those kinds of traditions. Another thing that was very strong in our day was the house system. Drake, Hawk, Rook and Wolf, I can remember where the, where the house is, and that gave us a sense of competition and loyalty to the house in rugby, cricket, I still the does that happen today? Well, we still have a house system, though the names have changed. They're now called Arvon, David, Powys and Gwent. Oh, that's very Welsh. <laughs> well, so, it's, uh, so it may seem. Uh, and uh, they perhaps play slightly less important part in the school, but they still are rather important in the fields that you mentioned, in competition in games, and particularly in the Eisteddfod that we hold each year, which is usually very successful and very enthusiastically supported. Lovely, yes. I can hear some singing now, which sounds as if it might be coming from a kind of assembly or a choir. Well, I recognise that, actually, as um, the old school song. So you still sing the school song, do you? No, to be honest, we don't uh, still sing that school song, uh, but uh, we've learnt it as a special favour for you. Oh, that's rather nice. <laughs> Enjoy that very much indeed. Oh, right, and this is Sam, which is short for Samantha. Hello there. Thanks very much. Uh, the headmaster told me you don't sing it uh, normally, but you've learned it especially. I just love it to hear it again. <laughs> Super. I suppose you sang in a choir in your time. Well, yes and no. When I first came to school, there was a choir, but at the end of my second year, the music master left, and they never replaced him. And uh, the Welsh master kept it going for a while, and then in my fifth year, there was nothing happening. And in total innocence, I knocked on the headmaster's study one day, and I said, excuse me, <laughs> but in a grammar school in the capital city of Wales. I think it's awful there's no choir. And he said, son, if you're so concerned, <laughs> do it yourself. <laughs> and so I did. And so I just formed a choir here, quite a large choir of, 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 of just boys then. So the little ones did the soprano after parts and the older ones tenors and bass. And we had a large choir. I found some music in the, the old music room in, the, in some storeroom. Him who plays Mendelssohn, there we are. I taught them that and we performed it. Was it just a choir that sang in school or did you take it out and about? Uh, both. We performed here obviously, but I remember forming then uh, a male voice choir out of that group, which is quite crazy really, of boys. Uh, but they were pretty good, big hefty rugby <laughs> players, you know. And we went and, and competed in the Irrid National Devot and uh, came second, which was quite good against sort of, you know, real male voice choirs. There's more uh, choral activity than just this choir in this school, isn't there? Yes, we have a magical group.
Dr. Z, would you like to give me a sentence or a statement about what you can see in that picture? The woman is washing her hair. That's good. The woman is washing uh, her hair. Now, I want you to would you put like your hands in the bag, Mohammed, and tell me what you think is in the bag. Choose one. Choose one. A purse. Good. What's the purse made of? Leather. Leather. Good. Well, this is the kind of class and the kind of classroom that couldn't have been here in your time. No, it reminds me so much of the schools my um, son and daughter go to in London. The number of nationalities, I just a quick glance here, now there must be at least a dozen or more different nationalities in this one group. I think it's amazing, and also the work they're doing here to teach them English as well. Yes, that's right. It's a language unit, and they are improving their grasp of English, which is not their mother tongue. But I, I'm surprised that you're so surprised, because when you were a youngster in Cardiff, there were a coloured youngsters at this school. That's, uh, how old are you? Yes, a few. Not, not as many as in this class, but also the ones who were here spoke English fluently because they were people who were brought up in Cardiff. Their parents and grandparents were Cardiff people. Whereas this is totally different, and it's, it's, it's amazing to see not only, okay, we all know the influx of, of different nationalities in different areas, but that this school has dealt with the problem of language, because how can we educate it without the language, and they've done it here. I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled. I think it's ironic that in your school days, as a Welsh speaker, you also were in a kind of minority, weren't you? Yes, because uh, in those days, there wasn't very much Welsh in Cardiff. And so when I came to the school, I was the only Welsh speaker, Another boy came the next year, and three years later, my brother. And that's all we were, Welsh speakers in the school. There would have been more people, of course, studying English, and that was something you enjoyed because of the man who taught you. Yes. I think, like most pupils, I think we are attached to subjects because of the character of the teacher. And the man here was Derry Williams, an actor himself. And he used to act, I think, in the lessons. But he had something here, that magic. He used to make the subject alive. Shakespeare came alive in his hands, you know. And I had a great time with him. Do you know what? Somebody told me that in the sixth form you studied Greek. Now, I found that hard to credit. Yes. Well, at the time, I was thinking of going for the ministry. And the classics master, Mr. Elliot, he was also my sixth form master, um, offered to teach me uh, New Testament Greek in his spare time, which obviously I found very interesting and a great help for me as well. If you'd gone in for the ministry instead of going for music, how would you have coped, do you think, in front of a congregation? Well, one of the things that this school was good at was giving us the opportunity to perform in any way possible. And uh, especially, for example, in, in the morning assembly, as prefects, we were encouraged to do the readings ourselves and the prayers and whatever. And that gave you the opportunity to stand in front of people so it became natural. Um, and also, I took part in school plays as well. Well, I go. Yeah. Think you'll make it? I don't know. I reckon he will. Did you see him selling fried those houses? Yes, I should say. He was laughing. He caught those days by surprise. Only a few casualties. Yes, but lucky he was so near our lot. Gosh, I'm tired. Hey, I, I wonder what those jellies were doing, snooping round here with that billet talk. There's no troops this side. Do not worry. I've got a nasty something telling me as if you're getting lazy. And what do you mean by that? I detect a distinct disinclination to pack. Well, that last voice was yours, and I'm amazed Hollywood didn't sign you up straight away. Well, I'm amazed, not at Hollywood, but I hate hearing my own voice at any time. But that was 1959. How on earth did you get that? Well, that tape was made and is owned by the master who produced the play all those years ago. He's retired now, but he's here, Tommy Foster. Hello, Mr. Foster. How are you? Why, you oh, I'm you old rascal. How nice to see you. <laughs> Good to see you, too. David, of course, I know. Nice mm -hmm. to be here. I want to ask you about Oh, and You call him a rascal. Was he a rascal? Well, of course, he was a rascal. I thought most of them were rascals, but he was a delightful rascal. Uh, some are not delightful, as you can imagine, but he was a delightful rascal. And what I liked about him was that he involved himself in virtually everything that we did in school, not just the lessons, anything and everything, and with good heart. He's remembered by some people for uh, saving your blushes, for having powers of leadership as a small boy. Oh, yes, indeed, yes. But leadership of the very best kind, I felt, even as a boy, because he never weighed down on the others. He joined with them and uh, did it by kindness, uh, as good schoolmasters do, of course. Oh, and Tommy symbolizes for you all the staff members of your time. What do you remember about him and them? 
Um, one everlasting memory is him teaching us Latin, and he used to say, Ugolo, Ugolari, <laughs> to strangle. Exactly. You knew exactly what it meant, and you never forgot it. But the main thing that we had between us was cricket. Um, in my first year joining the school, uh, Mr. Foster got hold of a dozen or so of the most promising people. Sorry. And every Saturday morning, outside school hours, obviously, we'd meet and he'd train us. It was the beginning of the squad system. And eventually, after a couple of years, this became a real crack team. And we eventually won one wonderful year when I was captain of the other, of the team. Um, we won the cup and the league for double. And the semi-final and the final was played on the Glamorgan County ground, the Armors Park. Well, that's right. Now the Cardiff Rugby Club pitch. A wonderful expanse of playing fields here, but they couldn't have been here at the beginning. No, they weren't. Um, as I said earlier, it was a brand new school, they had no facilities, and this was just a barren wasteland. Doesn't it look beautiful this afternoon? It was a gorgeous afternoon. And to watch a game like this is very, very nice. They're playing in the old school colours, by the way, black and cerise, which is rather nice. Do you play rugby? Yes, I, I play a lot here. Sport was very important uh, during my time in school. And cricket, as I mentioned earlier, and anything, really, but uh, rugby and cricket were the main games. There are soccer pitches here now, but there was no soccer when I was in school. And rugby, actually, uh, the playing of it here, I think has led to my lifelong love for the game. And my big relaxation, I think, from, from the profession, these days is to watch a good game of rugby uh, in London, with the London Welsh at Old Deer Park, or if I'm down in South Wales, uh, Cardiff or Bridge End are the teams I'll watch. That looks like quite a good team in the making uh, over there. On the other side of us, that looks like a, a pavilion, is it? Yes, it is, although again, nothing here when, 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 when I was a boy. Although these fields did come after a few years, there was no pavilion at all. And after I left, obviously they built one. Uh, yet I understand now that it's no longer in use as a pavilion. It's now a new six-form block. It's their own sort of premises, and, and they, uh, it's like a big common room for them, which is a rather nice idea. And indeed, here are some of the six-formers gathered together in, the, uh, in this block of theirs, and I know they're delighted you've been able to break off and talk to them. They've got some questions for you. They're so pleased to see us. They've even made us some coffee. Nice. That's Anatole in the middle of the front row. Uh, what do you want to know? Where's your favourite place to conduct? Is it St David's Hall or the Festival Hall or somewhere? Well, St. David's Hall, first of all, is a magnificent hall. There's no question at all. It's certainly the, um, we regard it as the finest in the country, and it's amongst the finest in Europe. Um, so, and that's a great thing for Cardiff, because for years as a boy, they talked about having a hall, there was nothing happening, and out of the blue, not out of the blue, but I mean, three years ago it opened, and, and that in itself was a magnificent thing for Wales, for Cardiff, for music, for everything, and for our, our own standards here, because we can perform to, I think, a much higher standard when we have a decent acoustic. So, yes, St. David's Hall. The Festival Hall is another place that I enjoy uh, because it, it, it's a beautiful hall. It's no place for faint hearts uh, because you're wildly exposed there. Uh, but I think that is the challenge, I think, that, 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 uh, that uh, spurs you on. So that's a nice place as well. Uh, the Concerto Bar in Amsterdam is a beautiful hall. And they're also different because that's an old hall. And you're also very, very aware of the tradition in a place as well when, you, when you're inside. Um, I did a concert the other day in the uh, Royal Albert Hall. And um, friends who were in the concert, some had come to the rehearsal as well, and were in the conductor's dressing room. They were saying, they were almost overcome by the fact they could feel this wonderful um, tension in themselves. They said, they said, good gosh, Sir Thomas Beecham has been in here, Sir Malcolm Sarge has been in here. And you feel that yourself and in the hall. And it's the hall that gives the atmosphere as well. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm Kathleen. I'd like to know when and why you decided to take up music as a career. Well, um, not when I was in school. Uh, I, I was going to go into the ministry, and uh, music was just an activity which I enjoyed. Uh, it was when I went to university, I was reading philosophy, uh, and also doing a lot of conducting. Uh, and I think perhaps people said, look, you've got a, a bit of talent. And um, also, as you get older, th things become larger in your life. And perhaps the realization that uh, I was going the wrong way um, that's quite a terrifying experience, by the way. I remember it vividly because it, um, it, it hammers away to your brain. And I remember the day that I went uh, to my father and said, I think I'm going the wrong way. I think I might want to do music as a career. 
And all he said, I think very, very wisely, I've been waiting for you to say it, but he himself didn't tell me. And that's important, I think, because uh, music as a career is a difficult one. Uh, I think you've got to be dedicated and realize, yes, I need to do that. That's what I felt, possibly, is that I needed to do it. My name is Helen. I'd like to ask, have you had any embarrassing moments in your career? Oh, yes, frequently. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you lose a button or knock some music over. I remember, even worse, um, in one concert, turning to the cellos, and they were very close to me. And I actually knocked, knocked, knocked their, their stand over. And that's, that's very embarrassing, because the lead cello was sitting there, smiling, <laughs> trying to remember the music. Somebody else on the floor. <laughs> And the people behind are laughing, so it's, uh, it's, oh, it's great, yeah. Well, thank you all very much indeed. A very absorbing, interesting exchange. I'd like you all to come over here a minute, because uh, come on where you can see this television set, because I'm going to show Owen something. He knows we're going to show him something, but you don't know what it is yet, do you? So take a look at this and see what you think of it. Hands above. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Boys yes. making for assembly, yeah? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's uh, an organist, and evidently, uh, <laughs> it's the start of your school it's, day. This is a morning, morning assembly. Head <laughs> Archibald Sinclair, the headmaster. There he is, Archibald Sinclair, the head. What is the assembly? Head boy. <laughs> it looks very formal indeed. Yes. And who is? Oh, good God! It's me. <laughs> we did the lesson. Oh heavens! Look at that. My <laughs> word. Oh, that's very embarrassing. <laughs> that would have been in the sixth form, would it? Yes. Good. Yes. Well, I'm sure that brought it back very vividly. It's very rarely that we've been able to show someone uh, themselves at school in this series of ours the happiest days. So, you've just had it recalled. Were they the happiest days? They were very happy days, no question at all. Um, it's difficult to say that they were the happiest days because um, so much has happened since, for me anyway. There are parts of your school days where um, the academic side is so hard and difficult uh, and, and laborious sometimes that that um, makes, makes life difficult. What I feel is that the richness and variety of my time in the school have given me very, very happy days since then. I'm able to enjoy particularly my career and my life and doing what we've done today because of what happened to me in my school days. Oh, I now, Royal Hughes, thank you very much indeed, but you're not quite off the hook yet. I know that uh, Sam has a last question for you. <laughs> well, as soon as you're here, would you, we would like you to conduct our choir today. I'd love to. It would be very nice. <laughs> thank you for asking me. Thank you very much.